um, uh, so welcome everybody to uh, our second webinar uh, from the IFS network uh, to complete or to enhance our uh, our program, which is uh, called the IFS Fostering Social Justice Program. Um, uh, our hashtag is for, so for social justice. Our network is called IFS, for those of you who don't know it yet. And our program, which is a European program, uh, is called the IFS Fostering Social Justice. I am the program coordinator. My name is Sophie Michelena, and I work for one of the national federations in the IFS network, which is uh, called La Fédération des Centres Sociaux. And that's our, that's our logo. Uh, it's a three-year program. We are coming to the end of it. Sniff, sniff. Uh, and there have been a lot of uh, of countries participating, 12, um, sorry, 11 countries, but 12 partners. Um, we have done a lot of good work and we are here trying to share some of the things we have discovered with you. These were the countries taking part. Uh, we have got quite a lot of countries represented around the room today, but not all of them. Uh, and uh, these are some of the sort of pictures of, of what we did in the program, which is go and visit each other and learn best practice from each other on three themes. The three themes are here and they were part of the three, uh, the, the three webinar series, migrant integration, active citizenship and social inclusion. And we have shared our knowledge across Europe on these three topics. Um, so today uh, we, we are at webinar two there is still one more, and in uh, this link, which we will send you afterwards, uh, you can uh, register for the next one if you are interested. It's in October. It will be on social inclusion, how we do it in the IFS network. Um, today, we've got an hour and a half together, a little bit less now, um, and uh, we will have roughly overall 30 minutes of presentations from two people. So that's two times 15. Then we will have uh, questions as a whole group to the two presenters. Uh, and then we will break off into small group discussions on some topics that we have thought about for you, but maybe you will talk about other things. We are not prescriptive. And then we will have a final feedback together. So that's it, that's for the hour and a half. If you've got a, a question, uh, just put it, put it in the chat perhaps because people are going to be talking and presenting. Um, and uh, I think we will uh, ask Peter, our first presenter, to introduce himself and to share his presentation with us. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much. Uh, I am very glad uh, to talk about the community organizing. And uh, yes, community organizing has um, almost uh, 100 years old story, but in Hungary it's quite new uh, because uh, we started to uh, deal with community organizing um, in the beginning of uh, in the uh, 2010 and um, my association, this is the Élet Fasegítő Szolgált Egyesület, which is in English. Uh, it's uh, Life Tree Help Service Association. Uh, we have started to work in 2011. And <clears throat> here in this uh, slideshow, I would like to briefly show you the uh, essential of uh, the methods and the viewpoint of uh, community organizing. And I would like to show a small Hungarian example pattern, what we have uh, uh, done uh, in our uh, work. But now, uh, just a small, uh, uh, small things about the situation uh, in Hungary and why we have uh, choose to turn to word community organizing. Um, 
after the changing of the uh, system in 1989, uh, the community the development and community work uh, occurred and has started uh, in in Hungary too. But uh, after 2000, uh, we thought uh, that we have to uh, introduce uh, new uh, methods, not only community development, uh, but we need uh, new uh, viewpoints in our community work. And it's because the uh, key problems uh, in uh, Hungary and uh, uh, the key problem is the democratic deficit and the low level of active uh, citizenship. So what we uh, thought that uh, community development and other methods of uh, community work are, are good, uh, but we need a little bit quicker and, and uh, deeper, uh, deeper methods of uh, uh, using the democratic technique and urge uh, people uh, to uh, uh, to learn how to be an active uh, member of the society because, because it will uh, ensure the democratic uh, way. But the whole context is what you have to know about uh, Hungary that after the changing of the system, uh, we had a quite deep economic and social crisis. And the main uh, problem uh, with it, uh, the huge loss of uh, workplaces, uh, because uh, under the so-called socialist uh, times, uh, the full work uh, places and the uh, uh, full employment uh, was the main political uh, aim and uh, the loss of uh, the workplaces caused uh, really a uh, lot of uh, problems. Uh, uh, a problem uh, in the Hungarian society is that it's in the uh, people's thinking uh, the strong dependency on state. So people are waiting uh, to get uh, some benefits or help or any other kind of help only from the state and uh, they are not really activate uh, themselves uh, to find their own way uh, to uh, try to solve uh, uh, their problem. And then another uh, uh, ongoing uh, problem is the concentrated uh, power. Uh, I mean the state and political uh, power uh, because it's uh, uh, a very uh, a very strong uh, dimension of uh, the daily life of uh, uh, Hungary, so it's uh, really hard to uh, really hard to uh, fight uh, and struggle uh, with or against uh, the power power in uh, Hungary. So that is why it is important. Uh, uh, to use the community organizing uh, method. And now you can see a brief, uh, uh, a brief sentence about what is uh, community organizing, which sorry, emphasize... Peter. Sorry, Peter, we cannot see that sentence. So do you mind seeing if you can move your screen along? Because we couldn't see your first slide and then the second one. Um, or, or if you want, I can I can share your presentation if you're having. Oh, trouble. it's interesting because 
it shows me that uh, you are screen sharing. It's okay. I can try and share your, your presentation if it's not working your side. Oh. Yeah? Okay. Oh, it's very interesting. Yeah, don't worry at all. We 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 were very interested. We just need to see that sentence now. So uh, I'll I'll put it on for you. Hopefully it will work. Please can some people tell me if it does work, but I know I am on other I'm on, I'm on a setting that doesn't allow me Okay, that's better. So we have seen the you have next, slide. Right. next slide is the sentence. Perfect. Okay. Right. Yes, this is. So uh, community organizing emphasizes the leadership that we have to find that kind of persons uh, who can be leaders in their community, or we can uh, say uh, that they are leaders in their constituency and it's uh, very important uh, that we have to form organizations uh, because uh, the organization's uh, resources uh, can provide enough power uh, to make uh, change. Let's see the next slide. So this is the community organizing uh, process which uh, starts with listening. So it's a bottom-up uh, method uh, where we start our work uh, with canvassing door-to-door uh, -door or uh, any other one-on-one -on -one interviews uh, uh, doing with as much people as we can. So sometimes we uh, make one-on-ones uh, dozens or, or hundreds of uh, listening because we have to uh, know what, uh, what are the problems, what the people have to solve, uh, what kind of change uh, they need and what kind of efforts uh, they would like to put in uh, to change uh, the situation where uh, they uh, live. So uh, listening is a core uh, method of uh, community organizing. And then we start uh, the forming, uh, forming of, of a, a group uh, uh, which leads to an organization. And the first step is uh, uh, to call uh, the people uh, to have a so-called uh, strategic meeting where we can start to discuss uh, what we uh, uh, experienced in the listening uh, process and uh, we start to discuss uh, the key problems, uh, what the people uh, uh, mentioned and told, uh, told us. And from the problems, uh, we will choose an issue. Uh, the issue is an, another uh, key element of community organizing because it's a small piece of uh, a bigger problem and we will uh, work on to solve uh, the issue we call it we win uh, the issue and uh, if we choose the issue uh, we will plan the strategy which means a lot of research work uh, because we have to uh, find uh, the target uh, person uh, where, to whom uh, we can put uh, pressure. 
we have to plan uh, the tactics. We have to know uh, who can uh, support our uh, struggle, who can uh, uh, make, who can make uh, any help uh, uh, to us uh, to build our our power. So uh, uh, another another key element is the power. That's why we listen a lot of people and we try to involve a lot of people because people can uh, show the power and the power is uh, the people uh, itself. After that, uh, we can uh, plan the tactics and uh, we decide what kind of actions uh, will we do to put pressure on the decision makers uh, to win our uh, issue. And in the end, of course, we will choose that kind of issues which are winnable. And uh, after the win, after the success, uh, we have a celebration. Uh, it's very uh, important to have the celebration because uh, it can provide uh, a common self-esteem uh, to the members who uh, played any kind of uh, role in the uh, process. And now I would like to show you a small Hungarian uh, example uh, from our uh, work. Uh, uh, we started to work in a small village with the uh, methods of community organizing. It's called Olas Liska which is a small uh, village northeast uh, in the northeast of uh, Hungary, around uh, 1,700 uh, people, and around 20% of the inhabitants are uh, Roma. And uh, especially we start to work uh, with the Roma population because uh, they are uh, the discriminated and uh, the most uh, uh, <clears throat> pressured or oppressed oppressed uh, group of the Hungarian uh, society, and they have the uh, uh, not uh, eligible. Uh, uh, access uh, to education, health care, and uh, uh, for, uh, for enough uh, income. So we say they live in deep uh, poverty. That's why uh, we used it. And the, another, another key element is uh, that the uh, uh, poverty in Hungary is mostly concentrated in rural areas in small villages. Here you can see uh, the photo uh, where uh, segregated uh, Roma uh, people lived. It's the so-called Danko Street. Uh, you can see some houses where around 100 inhabitants uh, live. Uh, it means that there are 11 families and 42 uh, children. And we have started uh, uh, our work uh, with uh, them. Uh, we had one-on-ones interviews uh, uh, with all uh, the uh, families, family members, and uh, of course the young uh, people too. This is the view of uh, the street, uh, from the street view. Uh, you have to know that uh, these houses are uh, not with comfort. Uh, there is no sewage in it. There is no running water. 
uh, in it, uh, uh, the road is uh, uh, in mud uh, because there is no pavement uh, on, on it and uh, the neighborhood connections are quite uh, problematic uh, too. So these were the key uh, problems uh, what uh, people told us and we choose the issue uh, which was to uh, make uh, clean uh, the street and uh, our our uh, action was uh, to organize a round table where the mayor, the local notary and social assistant and, and the uh, rubbish company uh, gathered and everybody uh, take, took a role uh, what uh, to do to solve uh, the problems. Uh, the mayor <clears throat> gave uh, some uh, money benefit uh, to the people to pay for the dustbins. Uh, the inhabitants uh, uh, went uh, to clean uh, uh, the uh, streets. Uh, and the social uh, assistant helped uh, uh, to them, and uh, in that uh, uh, in that in that half year process, it was a winning uh, event and a, a success because uh, the street uh, uh, went uh, clean. So this is uh, our short story, and in the last uh, last slide, you can uh, see the ECON. This is the European Community Organizing Network. Uh, here you can uh, see the web page uh, where you can find resources about the uh, about the European Community Organizing uh, uh, tools and uh, examples any and any other resources thank you thanks peter very much for your first presentation on community organizing um which is also done in other countries but we wanted to hear the specificity of peter's context and also um, his knowledge on community organizing is is, uh, is is very big because he also teaches and trains people in it. So it's wonderful to have you, Peter, and I'm sure there'll be questions later on. Um, and now over to another friend uh, on another side of Europe, uh, Crystal from the Netherlands on uh, asset-based community development. Over to you, Chris. Thank you, uh, Sophie. I think it's it's really interesting to maybe look into a bit where community organizing and asset-based community development overlaps or uh, where they might seemingly uh, contrast. Or so there's a lot said uh, about that in the past as well, which have provided some resources. But let's first um, delve into what it is. Uh, let me see if this works. You guys have my screen. Um, so maybe first, uh, I'm, I'm doing this from um, um, uh, LSA, LSA Bewoners, which is an organization in the Netherlands, um, which is basically a network of any kind of community-led organization. Could be um, community running their own neighborhood centers or um, concerned about public spaces or about sort of um, participating in policy, could be anything. Um, we've been around for about 35 years and we've been involved with asset-based community development maybe the last sort of uh, 10 to 20 years. Um, but perhaps it's a bit, uh, it would be helpful to know a bit about the context because we've heard a little bit about um, Peter in the context of Hungary. Um, I think it's, it's, it's probably fair to say that um, it's fairly different and to sort of view um, the conversation about asset-based community development, but also community organizing in that light. So 
Um, I'm not a historian, so I'm I'm just doing sort of the the highlights. And um, if you maybe talk to us, you know, one of my uh, uh, fellow uh, Dutch people, they they might have a different perspective. But I think this is this is um, helpful to understand uh, where we're coming from. So. Um, I think in, in the European context, the Netherlands is one of the, uh, I think, states has, has taken the welfare state the furthest. So, which means that in the, you know, the last 40, 50 years, um, our communities and people have been able to, to rely on the state to a large extent. So if you think about having a sort of a happy and healthy life, we would think of the state as our main provider of that. Um, so regardless of how you feel about that as a, as a concept, uh, reality is that in the last 10, 10 to 15 years, there's really been showing some cracks, um, uh, especially based on sort of austerity measures, so a lot of budget cuts, um, which has meant really that, that a lot of people who've been able to count on the state as a provider of welfare um, have been able to do so less and less over the last 10 years. The other thing is that um, perhaps in the past, if you if you go a lot further back, um, there was a lot of focus on the collective. So society was organized along the lines of, for example, different sort of faith denominations. You know, you'd have the church would provide uh, certain services um, and you would have that community, you know, you'd have the Protestants and they would have all kinds of facilities for the Protestants. And that was um, sometimes highly organized, but also very much community based. Um, with the welfare state, and I think especially the last um, last 10, 20 years, it's become sort of highly individualized. Um, and when the first cracks started appearing in the welfare state, you saw that it was very much looking at an individual approach. So a person might, a person might need something and then it would be um, that person's sort of responsibility to organize around themselves to, to, to solve that, but not really looking at the community as the answer. Um, interestingly enough, we have elections coming up um, quite suddenly, actually, it wasn't planned, but we have elections coming up in November. And uh, most political parties will mention community as one of the sort of pillars on which we are going to uh, build our um, sort of uh, um, social structures in the coming years. I mean, how they um, define community is very different uh, per party, but it at least make, makes it clear that it's, it's, it's an issue that is... Um, uh, gaining interest. Um, we have a very long tradition of participating in policy. So I would say that maybe between sort of the 1990s and 2000, up until 2010, um, we were fairly well organized in having a say in um, which direction policy should go. So uh, communities might be fairly well organized in, you know, going to the local uh, council and um, participating in uh, sometimes sort of co-creation processes. Um, but especially since you know, 2010, when austerity uh, kicked in and budget cuts started kicking in, it became more of communities doing it for themselves um, rather than just participating in, in sort of policy making. So that, that just as a, a sort of a, a context. Um, for us as an organization and I think the Netherlands as a whole, we we got introduced to uh, asset-based community development maybe in the sort of early 2000s when it started to kick off. And that was um, based on, um, let's see if this, yes, on the work by um, Jody Kretzman and John McKnight. So um, two people who in America went around loads and loads of neighborhoods really in, in sort of the thousands and they, start to figure out, so when do communities really thrive? When, what, 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 what makes a difference between thriving communities and communities um, that struggle? And they wrote a, a lovely book on that and um, there's a lot more nuance to it <laughs> than, than we'll go into in, in this session. But one of the things that they noticed is if there were certain assets um, available in communities, and people were able to, to make use of those assets. So not just them being there, but people were able to, to connect them and make them work for their communities is one of the things that um, really made a difference. And I mean, I think probably for the US, but especially for the Netherlands, that's quite um, a radical way of thinking because if you look at how we, especially from the welfare state, have 
uh, um, sort of perspective, we organized our work in communities that was based around what are the needs in a community. So we would be looking at, okay, so this community, there's a high prevalence of uh, sort of uh, crime, um, a lot of people without a job, um, maybe literacy issues. So we really quite scaled that actually to a very detailed level to figure out everything that's wrong within a neighborhood. And what John McKnight and Jody Kretzman realized is that even though you might um, need that information to make a policy, uh, that's not actually something that you can build on. So they they started to sort of put out the motto, focus on what's strong, not what's wrong. Um, and that means that you, you look at some of all the assets that are available in a community and how you might be able to leverage them to build a strong uh, community. And those could be all kinds of things. So I think the starting point, and perhaps that's the same as, as what Peter is also doing um, in Hungary, is that you sort of start with people. So what kind of talent, skills, passion, but also just time um, do people have that they, they might want to, to use for their community? Um, and then what kind of groups and networks are there? And that could be really organized groups. You know, It could be uh, really strong community-led organizations, but it could also be you know, the five people who meet every morning um, uh, when they're walking their dogs or the people who uh, might do some some gardening together in um, unused public space. So it could be anything. Um, then you have public spaces. Generally, for example, we also call them bumping spaces. So what are the places that, that people naturally meet? That could be um, at the schoolyard when you drop off your kids to school. Um, it could be at the local supermarket. Um, but they could also be, um, you know, large green spaces um, or maybe uh, community centers and the likes. Um, you've got local economy, and that's not necessarily just a formal economy. Um, there's lots of communities who've been able to leverage um, money that's being spent in the community and trying to figure out how to keep that within the community. Um, but it could also be more sort of the gray areas, you know, people... Um, doing things that maybe they shouldn't be doing um, from their garage boxes that are that they might not be paying taxes on, but are actually a part of that of that community or perhaps um, sort of the time banks or sharing of tools and and, and those kinds of things. Um, the institutions and that can be anything from let's say primary schools, but also um, housing associations or uh, local authority, how are they contributing to a strong community? Um, and sort of culture and tradition. So, you know, every every local community has certain traditions. So for example, where I live, um, we have a very um, elaborate celebration around King's Day um, with old fashioned games and things. And we do that every year. So a certain tradition builds around that. How can you use that to build from community. So the other perspective is that, as I said, that a lot of um, the work that we traditionally did was based on the state or the local authority being our provider of, of sort of welfare, of happiness, healthy lives. Um, and when you follow that logic, what, what happens is that you basically make the space for local authority or the state very big. And then you give the state the authority to say, actually, uh, we, we will provide for you. And there are some things that we could use your help with. And that's what we might call co-creation. You know, we will invite you to design something with us, or maybe you can do like your input, or maybe you can help us in the execution of it. Um, and then there's a last bit that's left. And that is, um, you know, the community can do that. Uh, it's great if it happens. If it doesn't happen, that's fine too. Um, it's not the essential stuff. So that's, that's the fairly sort of traditional model that we were used to. Um, whereas if you look at it from an asset-based community development perspective, it's actually the other way around. So you try and see how big can you make the space of the community? So what is it actually? So not as much of what are we allowed to do as a community, but what can we do as a community um, for ourselves and together? So trying to make that space as big as possible. And then there are certain things where you say, actually, you know, we need a little bit of help. So maybe um, can we have access to some space where we can um, uh, organize ourselves or meet each other? Um, or maybe we need some means, maybe we need need the money to, you know, it could be, it could be whatever, to, to provide some services for our own community. And then the last step will be, you know, there's certain things actually that we would like um, 
the local authority or the state to do for us. But the starting point is opposite. So you first look at what we can do as a community. And I think what's interesting and where sometimes there's discussion about um, whether this is perhaps a, a somewhat romanticized model is we're not trying to say that the state doesn't have any responsibility um, because that's often said, okay, well, this means that this is like a great argument for austerity, but that's not the idea. The idea is that you, you leave the space for the community to decide what is it that they want to take on themselves because they think they can do a better job and then working upwards. And that still means that the state is responsible for loads of things, but then because they're invited by the community um, to do so, which I think is a different thing. So what does this mean in practice? Um, first and foremost, it means that this is a process of the community, which can be quite challenging because as, a, as maybe a formal organization who is working within the community or perhaps even as um, uh, a national organization uh, as we are, we have to acknowledge that this is not ours. So the act of sort of community building, which is part of asset-based community development, um, is something that a community has to take a lead on. So you can take, you can use sort of intermediaries like community builders who animate the process, um, but that's always a process and it's never about the content. So that means that um, you can never predict beforehand what's going to happen. So you can say, well, our, our main goal is to make sure that a strong community exists, but you can't predict, predict if that's going to mean anything in terms of sort of community safety or health or employment or green spaces it could be anything because you follow the, pro the, the the sort of the energy and the assets that are there locally and um seemingly very small things can have a very big impact so it's, it's often quite hard to say so so why are we doing this we want to be able to measure um what our uh, investment or what our um sort of what our labor uh, comes to and um, we see that in many different ways. So in a, um, uh, in a community in Dutegem, I had to pick some um, places that have the in them, otherwise it doesn't feel properly Dutch. Um, they, started, they started with community building and it seemed very sort of on the surface, it just looked like people doing fun things together. Um, and that might feel as one of those things that's extra, like a nice to have, but not essential. But actually, if you sort of dig deeper in what that means is that... Um, one of the things one of our um, uh, contacts there said, he said uh, he was a police officer. He said, you know what? Um, previously, if I went on vacation, I would dread the moment where I would come back and open my inbox or all the messages left for me because there would have always been things that happened that had such an impact on people's life, but also meant that I had to fix all kinds of things. And he said, after this process started, um, seven months later, I went on vacation for two weeks and I came back and I had no messages. So that seems you can't really predict that that's going to happen beforehand, but it's a real tangible uh, result. Something similar happened in a, a big sort of apartment building where the housing association had was all kinds of issues around safety and um, um, well, bizarre, <laughs> it was pretty bizarre situations and also which meant that um, people didn't really want to live there anymore. So a lot of empty flats. And, um, and so the last resort was build, working on community building. It was really basic. People started to to knit together, you know, so you think that that seems fairly inconsequential, but people started to knit together, have conversations together. Um, you know, you know, which house number you live on. If you haven't seen someone for a few days, you say, oh, actually maybe I should ring your doorbell because it's kind of weird they're not here. So this slowly started to build on more and more activities. And, and two years later, there's a waiting list for people to, to start living in that building. So seemingly small things can have really big consequences. And if you want to um, uh, see sort of more tangible things as well, we um, on the Fostering Social Justice Project, we, um, uh, we hosted a visit as well. And one of the places we went to was the, the Weitpalais, which is um, sort of neighborhood palace is what it translates uh, to. Um, and their motto is um, the place to make it. And um, they mean that quite literally, as you can see on one of these pictures, but also metaphorically is the place to make it in life. And what you can see is that the, the picture all the way in the left is um, basically a group of women coming together and saying, actually, we lack spaces to meet together. Um, so why not in the summer, just go sit in the park and meet. And then someone found like an old, um, 
um, we call it a spring roll cart. So it's quite common in Ireland. You have little carts where people sell spring rolls. They, they found it um, for sale somewhere and they said, okay, this can be our meeting center. We'll start, we have something and we'll, we'll start organizing meetings around here. And it's really the community doing it for themselves. Um, and then they realized like, they could only do that in summer. So they needed something a bit more permanent. So they uh, went to a basement, um, um, it's the picture to the right of that, where you had to climb through the window to get in because they weren't allowed to, you were allowed to use the space, but not sort of the main entrance. It's quite funny when the mayor came to visit and he had to climb through the the window as well to, to get in. But then that place got sold. And then I think some of the work that Peter is talking about from more of a community organizing perspective said, actually, we've built something really great here for the community, um, but it's being sold and we didn't have the opportunity or we didn't get a fair opportunity to uh, to be uh, part of the bidding process to, to take it over ourselves. So they went to the local authority and mobilized people around it, meaning that they were allowed to stay uh, until the local authority found a new place for them which they did, which is the, the the picture next to it, where they actually said, you know what, we are actually going to build this palace together. So many Saturdays are spent, and they still do that now, to literally build the inside of that building. It's 2,000 square meters, an old school building. And after renting it for three years, um, they were given the option to buy it. So now it is completely community owned. They um, bought it for 1.7 million um, euros. So they bought a loan, they did lots of crowd lending, um, which I think is an interesting sort of tangible um, experience from the first um, start where you have conversations and just start uh, to figure out, okay, how can we build community to slowly in the process of 10 years coming to own a building? Not to say that that is the eventual goal. So, so this sort of asset-based approach, it doesn't mean that every community has to work towards owning a building or owning an assets and doing that by themselves, but just to show there's many different ways to, to, to take that asset-based um, approach. Um, and maybe just last, because there's so much more to be said about this um, asset-based community development or ABCD as we call it. Um, that I would really recommend looking um, and reading about some of the work that, for example, Cormac Russell has done, some great resources in English um, to explain a bit more about how the sort of the daily practice of asset-based community development works. Um, and Cormac Russell and Nick Garden, Nick Garman is, um, is uh, the person who worked really hard on community organizing. They wrote a few excellent blogs on how um, community organizing and asset-based community development fit in where they might seemingly look different, but actually are great um, additions to each other. Thank you so much, Chris. That was both theory and practice again. And uh, both our presenters have, have done us a really great job in presenting their local context, uh, some really interesting ways of doing work in our sector and what's actually happened when they do it. So. Seriously, very much, uh, very big thanks to both of you. Um, and, and now I, I'd, I'd like to open five to 10 minutes worth of discussions. If there's not many questions, maybe only a few minutes, but if there's a few questions, then let's take them now. And if you do not know what kind of question you would like to ask, because it was such great presentations, I'm going to put in the chat two that we, we thought about for you in case uh, they are of interest. The first one is, how do we or how do you support people's development in your community using listening? Uh, because that was a word that was important to us. And then how does challenging power imbalances, power between the decision makers in the community, fit with your organization's priorities, but also with your funding uh, context? So if you have got a municipality that funds you, uh, are you able as a community to say, we, we also need help with this or shift that power with them? So those were two uh, lines of direction for questions, if you want to talk about that. But if you've got other questions for Peter and Crystal or any comments, then we'd like to take them now. Thank you. All you have to do is unmute because I'm not going to see everybody's hands. Okay, I start then. <laughs> I don't really have a question. I, I'm just very impressed with what you uh, presented. And I think 
there are so important basic principles that you both um, echo in, in your presentation, and that is about to the importance of promoting what is uh, what is strong and to pre to instead of preventing what is uh, bad, uh, and uh, also this very strong bottom up perspective and to regard people like subjects not objects and i think these things are very very basic and important in being successful in in, in this community organizing so thank you very much for your very good examples any more thoughts or questions can I maybe ask a, a, a counter question? Is that okay? Mm -hmm. So I think it, it, it leans a bit on what you said, um, uh, stuff. And I think one of the things that we've, um, as a national organization, uh, always struggle with is the idea that um, uh, to get funding for the work that we do, we have to um, sort of highlight all that is wrong in the world, basically. <laughs> so, you know, we basically have to say, our neighborhoods are in terrible state. You know, it's, it's, if we don't do something now, uh, who knows what will happen to these poor people, which is completely counter um, everything that we believe in, this sort of asset-based approach. So I'm, I'm, I'm really curious if if any of the people here have sort of experience on how to uh, on, on how to do that. So we always try to sort of come up with a twist in the story. So, you know, say, but actually our approach is this, but I'm wondering if other people face that sort of same issue i would say it is exactly the same uh, in sweden um we you know we here we have uh, quite a big problem with criminal gangs and, and shootings and that kind of stuff and especially in certain uh, neighborhoods uh, but the only thing that the authorities are ready to support with is like uh, more policemen and uh, more punishment um it is very hard to 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 get them to listen of the of the importance of of working um, to, to promote people's uh, strengths, what's good in the society, to to create a strong community uh, to to make some um, uh, pro successful work uh, for a longer time. Uh, I think and that is also a problem with with politicians that they try to find very quick fixes and uh, that it is everything has to happen at once you don't look how you can strengthen communities for example in, in the long run just to to um, solve uh, an acute problem right now and it is very yes, hard to get funding for that kind of kind of uh, long term job Yes, it's the same in Australia. Um, I think, you know, sorry, I started talking and I was muted. Um, yeah, it's the same in Australia. Um, you know, you're funded under a very much a deficit model. You know, what outcomes, um, you know, do you have for uh, these for disadvantaged communities and and um, uh, disadvantaged people, and and politicians always look for the um, you know short term gains rather than long term development, and um, I think you know it's what interests me most. I think the asset based community development and the community. Um, organising that Peter was talking about, get, being active citizens, um, those two things um, can go hand in hand. I think you know it's it's um, it, they overlap quite considerably, and I, I, you know, overcoming political or over, becoming active um, in your community, um, I. Th is really important to that democratic process because one you have a say two you get you you build a, a culture in your community about um participation 
and taking responsibility and um, having and making a change. And if you can do that at a local level, then you can do it at a higher level. And that's where organisations come in, you know, you form organisations and then they advocate, et cetera, et cetera, and you keep on pushing that adv adv advocacy up the line. And um, often we get too caught up in the day-to-day, -day, um, you know, organisation of what we're doing in our community centres and our programs and all that kind of thing. And um, we forget about pushing the advocacy upwards, but we do that by getting people involved and forming this culture really of participation and active participation. And, um, yeah, so I think the two of those things go hand in hand. But the whole listening thing I think is really important, what Peter was talking about and, um, you know, what we often assume that we know what's good for people. Uh, you know, community workers are really good at that. And um, and so both asset-based community work, you know, you don't know what you're going to end up with in the end if you're doing your community development right, you know, because it depends on what people talk about and what they're willing to be involved in and what they're willing to, um, what their bottom line is and what they're willing to trade off and who they trust. You know, all those things become really vital and your and organisations influence often equals the amount of power that they have. And so, you know, you ask yourself, what's your sphere of influence and um, uh, in an organisation as well? So they're all things that, you know, I think, think about when I hear you um, both Crystal and Peter talk about those methodologies and um, yeah active citizenship is really that the key and listening is the start of that. I, I, I find it interesting also I think how you define active citizenship so um I mean, I guess it's all what's in the word. So we've we've tried to sh um, sort of shy away from citizenship in, in the sense that that um, implies that it's always about um, your relationship to the state, um, mm -hmm. whereas it's also about what do you do as a community without the involvement of the state, whereas eventually, of course, there are issues where you will need the state or where you... So it's quite an, 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 an interesting... Um, Issue, I think, and what you said, oh, if you if you do it if you do it right, you don't know what you're going to end up with. I can imagine that for quite a lot of community centers, that's fairly challenging because your funding model is very much well. It's often not easy, so you, you're focused on making sure your community center, you know, stays up and running, and then you have this whole wide world outside of it and maybe they you know you have community that that operates sort of outside of your community center and, and what is your sort of responsibility to that wider community and are they important to you if they don't come to your community center you know i mean obviously they, they are but in the day-to-day -day practice um how do you how do you make sure you um sort of keep that explicit or impl implicit promise alive as well I also like to, you know, I agree with those, your comments there, Crystal, but I'd also like to ask Peter, sometimes it's, a, especially around the citizenship question, I wonder how much that's um, an issue around how oppressed you are as a person in a state. Um uh, because I think um, that that's a real issue in itself. You know, I think of um, in Australia, uh, First Nations people, uh, just like Peter was talking about the Roma, um, you know, they have been, you know, killed and had their children taken away and, uh, you know, they're not even at this point recognised in our constitution. 
So what does that mean in terms of the state? We're having a big debate about that in Australia right at the moment. But I think that also lends, like the method that Peter has chosen um, it, and issues of citizenship become a real, a real issue in that. So it depends on where you're coming from, I think. Sorry, thank you for those thoughts, uh, Lynn. And I, I think we've had, um, yeah, already some really interesting discussions uh, as a whole group. There is a there is a, about thirty minutes left to this session. So what I, what we had thought about with Chris and Peter is to break you up into groups. We're going to create three groups now, um, and you are going to have sort of fifteen minutes, one five, maybe a little bit more, but we'll see. Uh, to chat in your groups of three or four, so it should be um, enough time, uh, about uh, some topics that we have actually prepared for you. But once again, uh, this is just to help you. In case this helps you, then please. Uh, so if you go to, so there are three questions here. Who can you cooperate with in your country or internationally to make more of this bottom up work approach? Question B, how do volunteers and staff contribute to this asset-based work? Question C, how do we know the social impact of this work when there is no preset agenda? So a little bit about what we said here, we don't know what's gonna happen. So how can we measure things and how can we tell people in advance that we think that's what's gonna happen? If there are any other discussions in your groups, please do uh, write them down. I have asked uh, Junias in group one, Chris in group two and Philip in group three to help write in the boxes, but if other people want to, please do. I'm going to put the link in the chat so you can all get to this document. And when we come back together in 15 minutes, uh, it would be really great if each group could have uh, a key point they want to share back with the group, one key point in yellow, and any actions that you might think should follow up this these discussions in this webinar, uh, then put it here and we can talk about it when we all come back. Um, does this all make sense to everybody as a way to proceed? I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Just ask if, any questions if you don't understand. Uh, I can see some people have typed in the discussion groups. Okay. Uh, somebody needs to go. Um, okay. So I'm going to swap. I'm going to put Peter in where Stefan was going to go. And that is going to make three groups of three, I believe. So bye-bye, uh, Stefan. And uh, this is the document to edit. If you have any problem, let me know. And now I'm going to send you into your three groups for 15 minutes. Sophie. Yes. I'm going to have to leave as well. I just have five minutes. Sorry. Okay. Could you start the group? And I will go myself in that group, uh, please. Could you be in group one and start um, Anthony and Virginia discussing things? Okay. I will be there after that. Okay, yeah. thank you, everybody. Go to your groups. <laughs> Enjoy the discussion. 15 minutes. Um, so we have six minutes. People might need to go. Or maybe some people can stay a bit longer. I can stay a little bit longer. So let's see how it goes. But in the next few minutes, could we have two minutes per group to, to give us the feedback of what their, their group talked about? We said one key point that stands out and one maybe action uh, that some people thought about uh, in their group after, the, for the, after this webinar. So who wants to speak? Yeah, so somebody who wasn't in the webinar wants to speak. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, don't be shy. Hello, uh, shall I start? Oh. oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you start. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not sure if we completely followed the assignment, but perhaps one of the things, one of the discussion points that we got to towards the end, um was what kind of conditions do you need for this type of work to work? Um, so one of the questions was, um, does this work in um, sort of high poverty 
situations. Um, so I think, and, and perhaps that could also be a sort of a future work, we'll be interested to see if we can collect some examples of uh, which different kinds of conditions need to be met for this to work. So that could be either about um, in the sort of economic circumstances, but perhaps also about sort of partnership working. So I think um, we, we I think we had very different experiences in, in between Hungary and, and, and at least the Netherlands as well. So it would be interesting to see you know, what, why that is and um, that might make it more useful for different countries. Fantastic. I like that. We should talk to Econ about doing a joint workshop about this. Um, great. Okay. Philip, what else came up in your group? Um, we started off with like a free form discussion or around a little more going in detail about asset based and deficit based uh, community work. And because I am always interested in the point of because what really bothers me at the moment, what is difficult for me is the rise of the far right in our country, right? And I am, and all the politicians, it, the numbers go up and up and our politicians always ask, why is that? What can we do about that? And a lot of people came up with the theory that maybe a lot of people feel alienated by current politics. So, um, a lot of people when we since 2014 we had a lot of uh, a lot of refugees uh, refugees in germany it started with the syrian refugee crisis and so um people a lot of people in the in the population got kind of worried about how much how much capacity there is in germany to take in and um we decided from from a political course on the on the course of we can make it work we just um, like we can, we take as many refugees in as we can, and we mm -hmm. can make it work. Um, now, at the moment, a lot of people think that people's worries got kind of brushed aside, and uh, that that alienated them, and so they uh, they they went to the far right. And uh, so, for me, the question is, if asset based and deficit based work rule each other out. Or if we can um, acknowledge uh, the people's worries and still, um, for example, um, well, the example I did, if people are worried about rising crime rates, right, do not tell them, well, there won't be any rising crime rates. Tell them there may be rising crime rates, it could happen, but we still have the human humanitarian responsibility to act um, in a social manner. So yeah. take as many as many refugees as we can in. And even though you're worried, which might which, which might be difficult, still we have the responsibility to still act. Okay. Um, Th yeah. Thank you, Philip. Sorry, I'm mindful of time, but I'm, <laughs> Sorry. we're gonna finish okay. at five, but if some people want to stay on, we can, okay? We're gonna release people at five. I'm gonna try and do that. I will just share that from my group, what we did talk about a lot was volunteers. We said that volunteers are a key part of this work and that engaging with them in the ways that linked to what the volunteers bring themselves is important. So if a volunteer likes to cook, well then maybe they're gonna to want to be involved in a cooking activity more than a looking after children activity. So we shouldn't put volunteers as well. This approach could be used for volunteer engagement and retention. And finally, uh, somebody in our group said that they would like yeah. to share the ABCD approach yeah. with an existing group they have uh, that works and meets. They're going to share that with them. So maybe they can use that approach to do something in their neighborhood in France. Also, very quick for me, I think volunteers, we in Germany made the experience that it's so important because we have volunteers that come from the community that were refugees themselves. So they have a unique and really great understanding about the work which is to do. So a lot of the volunteers come from the same from the same roots. Yeah. Absolutely. And on that note, as I said, please stay behind for any other discussions, but we are going to try and close the the official part of of this uh, of, of this meeting. Uh, I'm trying, but this is, I'm struggling with my toolbar. Ah, that's it. Da, da, da. Right. 
So please follow us. Please say hi on social media. We've got lots of resources on our uh, on our platforms. I will send you this link. And uh, basically, uh, yeah, the resources we are suggesting you look at as well as as Econ uh, as a potential partner for us as well, I, IFS to work with. Thank you very much to our presenters who have been wonderful and all your participation from all over the world. It's been very much appreciated. And now I'm going to 